the glory. Let him hear your voice this morning. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We worship you. We magnify your holy name. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you adoration. Thank you, Father. Glory be to your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we worship. Almighty God, we, we your children, are saying good morning to you. Thank you for your mercy. Because it's of your mercy that we are not consumed. It's because that message is renewed every morning, that's why we are here today. It's not everyone who slept yesterday who is awake today. Accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for making it possible for us to come to this trip. There will be many who will want to come who may not be able to come because of ill health or because of financial hardship. But in your own miraculous way, you've made it possible for us to be here. We appreciate you, Lord. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. And thank you for all you've done since we came. Thank you for what you will do today. Thank you for what you will do in the rest of the trip. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. This morning, my Father and my God, please speak to us. Amen. Bless us. Amen. Challenge us. Amen. Change us. Amen. Daddy, we are praying that by the time this trip is over, our lives will be radically changed. Amen. That we'll be closer to you. And we'll know you more. Amen. Love you more. Amen. So we can serve you better. Amen. Please take care of the homes we left behind. Amen. And send help to all your children. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Let someone shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. I shake out with one or two people and say, Good morning, God bless you. Seated, but I can see some empty seats in front. So if you are at the back, will you move a little? It's so good to see you. Uh, you are history makers. This is my own first trip to Turkey. Um, we've been to the nations around, but uh, it's the first one here. So thank God that you are part of the team. Um, when we went to Israel for the first time in 1995, there were only 50 of us. But God so touched us that um, since then things have grown. Now we can tell people, sorry, we don't have enough room for you. You have to wait for two years. Um, many people didn't come on this trip because they were afraid. But uh, you are here. 
My time God has finished with us, I'm sure you'll be happy you came. Our morning devotion will normally be taken from open heavens. So it will be Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Colossians 3, 1 to 6. And we will deal with it the way we deal with open heavens in my house. After somebody has read it to us, we throw the floor open and ask for your comments. In other words, not just what is written there, but some new revelations that God may give you, you will contribute. And then I will add one or two things that are not already written down there. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 6. As somebody read it for us. We're going to need microphones. Okay. If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For we sin sake the wrath of God comment on the children of disobedience. Okay, as the passage. Who's, who's going to be the first to comment? I think we'll just take three brothers, three sisters because of time. So when you are ready, you raise your hand. And I think somebody will want to lay a record to be the first one to... Ah, uh, uh, yes, sir. I'd like to speak on verse 2 set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth affection is another word for describing one's love what one loves and what one is paying special attention to this place is very important today because of um, the situation we have all around us where and when people pay attention more on things on the earth especially in the church where our affection gradually is being shifted to earthly things it is very important therefore for us to meditate very well on this verse to locate within us where our love, our first love, has gone to, so that we can return our affection on things above. Thank you, sir. Well done. Yes, as well done. That's, uh, yes, another brother here. Yeah? Uh, if you look at the first verse, said, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. It tells us that when we, were, when we gave our life to Jesus, according to Ephesians 2 5 to 6, we were relocated, our position had changed. Well, we're now seated in Christ in heavenly places. If we are raised in Christ, Christ is at the right hand of God. Then our position is in Christ. So those things that, uh, that we are doing before, we can't do it anymore. We must now identify our position, sit there, and do what Christ will expect us to do. We are in Christ, and we should now set our affection on things that glorify Christ. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, last brother here. 
praise the Lord. Amen. When the Bible says, set your affections on the things that are about, eh, I was stuck there because I thought of First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, which says that what the eyes have not seen, nor hear heard, nor see enter into the heart of man, what God has prepared for his own people. Then how do I know the things that are about? It means that I have to pray for divine revelations so that God can show them to me. Obviously, I can think of Jesus that is about the throne of God and so on. But it means that if God has kept certain things for those that love him, and eyes have not seen it, nor hear heard, nor know, as he entered to the heart of man, it means that we need some divine revelations. Secondly, I also talk of a thought of Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, which says that things that are seen are temporal, or things that are not seen are eternal. That shows that the things that are above are eternal, which only God can reveal to us. Praise the Lord. Very good contributions from the boys, not the girls. Yeah, there's a girl back there. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And um, thank you for the contributors earlier. I'm going to um, use verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil cons, copious sense, and covetousness, concupiscence, and which is, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, a trip to Turkey is an evidence of verse 5, what the people of great nations that have really made it and they forgot God. And <clears throat> verse 6 also mentioned what their <clears throat> results will be, uh, which we have seen in all the sites we've been. We've seen great palaces, great nations, and uh, great powers, and what they used, uh, the gift of God. All that God has given us are gifts, and we are not supposed to abuse it, and um, thank God for the revelation of us as being born again to start concentrating on what are the true riches of God and to look more on that. Because <clears throat> if we don't mortify our bodies, because we have to continually fight the flesh, because all these things are all evident around us. Thank you, sir. Good. Ah, uh, yeah, please. Here, yeah, to my left. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. For me, what I understood from verse 3, he says, For I'm dead, and my life is now hidden with Christ in God. The Bible says, When we are in Christ, all things have passed away, and all things have become new. We all know the, the, the life of Christ. It's not just an ordinary life. It's a life that is in God. And we all know that God is greater than everything. From what we have seen, for me in particular, I'm so scared, I'm so terrified. Because what I read in the Bible, I'm saying life. That means there is a hand somewhere which no man can see, but yet we can see the work. So as Christians, we are not ordinary people. And we shouldn't think like ordinary people because our lives are in Christ. Christ in God. What does that tell us? No one can harm us if we're in Christ. Amen? No one. We are in the nation. A Muslim nation. A nation that who knew God some years back, but today they don't know God. For me, I look at it that Father, I have come here to claim this nation for you. Because my life is in Christ. And Christ is in God. Christ expects me to claim wherever the soles of my feet tread upon for him. This was what Paul did. And we read it. Now we have come back to take back what the devil stole. 
I'm so annoyed in my spirit, seeing the greatness of God. Praise the Lord. And I know by the grace of God, by the time we go back, we will pray. And this nation will come back to God. Thank God we have a warrior in the house. <laughs> One more sister, Abby. Afraid to take it all. Just one more sister, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Praise the Lord. I just want to dwell on um, verse 6. It says, because, because of this, the wrath of God is coming. This shows that God is no respecter of any, of any person or any nation. If the wrath of God has come to the people of this land, based on maybe they didn't, they didn't do what God told them to do. And we can see the effect on the land now. Which means that we need to actually look at our life and begin to see in which area do I need to put back to God? In which area do I need to mortify myself and you know, allow the glory of God to shine, allow the holiness of God to shine? If the wrath of God is going to come upon the people that did this, then we can be very sure that if we don't align ourselves to the word of God, to the word of God, that wrath of God is going to come because God is no respecter of anybody. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Uh, beautiful contributions. I hope the rest of us will get ready for tomorrow. Just read the uh, open heavens in advance so you know the topic for tomorrow morning. Uh, we are visiting seven churches and I'm sure if you read the book of Revelation you know that there are seven letters to the seven churches because we don't have enough time to take the letters one by one because if we have to do that that will take seven days or seven meetings which will knock off one or two other things um, what I have decided to do is to look at the letters, the seven letters, and select things that are common to all. For example, uh, in every letter, with the exception of probably one, there are warnings. In every letter, you have advice. In every letter, you have promises to overcome us. So when we gather beginning from tonight, by the grace of God, we will start by looking at things that are common to all the churches. Uh, tomorrow evening, I'm told there's going to be a minister's conference, so if you are not a minister, you are promoted. <laughs> At least you become field minister. You know, when you go to war and uh, the battle is hot and then all of a sudden uh, a lieutenant falls, the captain will look around at somebody and say, okay, you are, you are now a lieutenant at least for the purpose of the war. <laughs> when the war is over, you say, oh God, you are... <laughs> you are still general duty unless you now go for the necessary training to become a lieutenant. So, tomorrow, even in dealing with ministers who seek stick to uh, the letters to the churches, speak something that we know will speak to everyone, particularly ministers. And then on Friday, uh, we might omit Monday devotion uh, from the open heavens in order to be able to deal with another thing that is common to all the churches. Because in the evening, we'll be having uh, Holy Ghost service. I think they call it Festival of Life. It's okay by me. But the original name is Holy Ghost Service. Uh, and uh, 
by Saturday it's going to be enjoyment, I understand. Uh, they said there'll be a cruise or something. Uh, is that not so? Uh, so good. But I'm sure of one thing, whichever way we go, uh, by the grace of God we shall be loaded by the time we are going home. My contributions will for this morning will be that this passage is actually talking to us about the importance of focus. Where is your focus? Because what to focus on is going to determine what you will become. If you focus on God, it's not going to be long before we begin to see the evidence of God in you. In Exodus 33, Exodus 33 from verse 18, I think, to 23. Exodus 33, 18 to 23. Moses said, My desire, God, is to see your face. I just want to see your face. The Almighty God told him, hmm, if you see my face, you will die. But I respect your desire. And so I will give you a glimpse of my backside. And it will trust you that uh, There's hardly any record of anybody else who ever saw what Moses saw. Where is your focus? You see, because when Moses saw that glimpse, by the time we got to Exodus 34, from verse 29 to 35, Exodus 34, from verse 29 to 35, the Bible tells us that his face began to shine. He took something from that glimpse. So powerful that from that day on till he left the, this earth, anytime he wanted to speak to people, he had to cover his face with a veil. The glory was so powerful that ordinary eyes beholding the face of Moses now, not God, said that, sir, if we don't want our eyes destroyed, cover your face. It's something you need to think about. When you focus on God, it changes your uh, biological makeup. It gives you the kind of health and strength that is uncommon. Health and strength that is uncommon. You are able to achieve what ordinary humans cannot do. And I'm talking about even in the physical now. When I was uh, discussing with some people about the little that we have been able to achieve since the beginning of the year, when I told them, oh, since the beginning of the year, we had a normal legal service at the camp, 
Then we had the one in Napa, we had the one in Uyo, we had the one in Portacot, we had the one at the University of Ibadan, we have one at the University of Lagos, we have one uh, at the Obafemi Auro University, we had one at Apure, as so he said, sir, how do you do it? I said, I don't do it. But I know the one who does. And I focus on him. And that was for January. By then, of course, the thing had kept on mounting, increasing. And we'll see here. When you focus on God, you become more and more like him. That's important. When you focus on God, you are able to obtain victories that are not normally available to ordinary people. Classical example is David versus that we read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. You can read from verse 34 to 51. 1 Samuel 17 from 34 to 51. When Moses was giving his testimony to King Saul, remember what he said. A lion king took one of my sheep I snatched the sleep, the sheep out of his mouth. He rose up against me and took him by the bear, smote him and killed him. That's easy to read. You need to imagine it. If you have ever seen a lion before, you will get the full impact of that story. A lion is not an animal you joke with. When an animal picks one of your flock, you want to thank God that you are safe. I didn't pick you. You don't go and challenge a hungry lion. Lion normally don't kill except they are hungry or unless they feel threatened. But if this fellow is hungry, he's found food, you snatch his food from him. Automatically, it means then you, you will be the food. And then, how does a 70 year old boy punch a lion to death? I'm sure you probably have watched uh, Animal Planet on television, or some if you have never seen a lion before in the physical. I have seen a pack of lions bring down a giraffe as tall as that fellow is, as big as it is. I have seen lions eat up young children of, uh, of an elephant. I have seen lions kill crocodiles. And yet this boy fought by boxing. <laughs> And he didn't end there, he went further to talk about a beer. You have also seen a beer. And he said, I dealt with him the way I dealt with the lion. But it gave us a secret. The God who delivered me from the power of the lion and the power of the beer, he would deliver me from this giant. His focus was on God, on God. You know many a times when some people testify, you will see who did the miracle. <laughs> I had this problem, then I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And I remembered what Daddy had taught us, I prayed. The emphasis on I. Not on God. And it's not 
That's not limited to members of the congregation giving testimonies to the Lord. Many a times, you see the minister of God standing there, wanting to take the glory. I mean, watch television, you see somebody, yes, God has healed somebody. And the minister of God still wants to show that he's the man with the anointing. And he still lay hands on the one who said he had been healed. So that you people will know, if you were not there when I did the praying, watch me now. When you focus on God, you can predict victory. David said, I'm going to cut off your hair, Goliath. Do you know that when he was saying that, the Bible said there was no sword in his hand? So with what is he going to do the cutting? When you focus on God, your sayings become a decree. Because when he said, I will cut off your head, O Goliath, by saying so, that statement provided the weapon that will be used. Focus on God. I told you the story before a young man came to me several years ago and said, Daddy, I want to be one of the three who will sponsor the convention. We were small then. Convention will be about 10,000 people. <laughs> I want to be one of the three that will feed everyone who will come to the convention. Very small boy. I looked at him and I laughed. Your faith must be big. He said, Yes, sir. Well, we prayed. God help me. Following week, he came, agitated. The idea I said, I want to be one of the three who will sponsor the convention. Now I'm sacked in my place of work. <laughs> and, and I laughed. I said, you think you will sponsor the convention on your salary? God has to shut the door to open another. Because he said, I want to do it. God transferred what he said into a decree. And by the end of the year, because God opened another door, by the end of the year, it was one of the three. Focus on God. What you focus on determines what you become. That's number one. Number two, what you focus on determines, or shall I put it this way, who you focus on will determine who you will become. That's going a step deeper. Who you focus on determines who you become. Let, let's take uh, one or two examples very quickly. Let's take the example of Elijah and Elisha. Second Kings chapter 2 verse 9 to 15, 2 Kings 2, 9 to 15. Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want me to do for you before I be taken away from you? He said, thank you, sir. I've been waiting for this moment. I left everything to focus on you and your ministry. Pouring water on your hand. I know a day will come when I will be rewarded. Now the day has come. What I want is a double portion of your spirit. You know the story. The man of God says, Son, you've asked for a hard thing. But if you see me, if your focus remains steady, you will get what you want. But 
time we get to verse 15, all the sons of the prophets came, bowed down before him, and said, The spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. Don't forget, these same sons of prophets have been mocking him. They said to him, <laughs> oh, My daddy, do you know daddy is going today? Then we will see what will become of you. All these arrogance, pretending as if you are superior to us. We will see before the day is over. And they saw. They saw. Who you focus on will determine who you will become. That's very important. Very, very important. Um, I think I was telling them at the minister's conference in Jaws, because I've just finished that one before coming here. And I was talking about the issue of fatherhood. That who is your father will determine who you will become. And you can have two fathers. If you have two fathers, you are a demon. <laughs> and I said something that made them laugh. I said when the woman is promiscuous and we had a lot of concubines, so that when she became pregnant, we don't know who is the real father. In the olden days, they call such a child a jumabi. Collective responsibilities. <laughs> That's why we don't know who is the real person. It is important because the reason I just diverted a little bit towards that is because when Elijah was being taken from Elisha, he said, My father, my father. Don't forget he had a, an earthly father. But he shifted his focus from the day he came in contact with Elijah. His father became a brand new one. At the end of the day, he got the blessing that only a father can give. Who you focus on will determine who you become. When I joined the Redeemed Christian Church of God, I was the most educated in the church. But God told me clearly, my father is none other than the founder of this church, and he was an illiterate. You may not fully understand, but it's not easy for a PhD in mathematics to submit to an illiterate. Um, if you are looking for people who are truly, truly, truly arrogant, look for a mathematician. That's the truth of the matter. They believe that the rest of you are to be tolerated. <laughs> because let's face facts, we all know mathematics is the most difficult subject in the world. Uh, because it doesn't allow for maneuvering. It's either you know it. Ah, so it's easy to discover your secret. <laughs> Just one example. The other people who want to pretend to be like mathematicians are lawyers. That's why they call themselves learned. How learned they yeah, are, you have to find out. Uh, thank God for lawyers, even though they are troublemakers. Biggest of them is Apostle Paul. He created quite a lot of problems for those of us following. Peter said, this man is, uh, some of his writings are difficult to understand. Who you focus on determines who you become. But God told me clearly, as I told them at the minister's conference, Son, the day you leave the redeemed Christian Church of God, your firstborn will die. He knew that uh, there will be temptations because of uh, changes, have differences in education. Suppose I had left the redeemed. I won't be where I am today. And uh, 
you are not likely to be here today. Be careful who you are focusing on. Because that's the fellow you will become. I told them, I don't know why God is bringing this up, but somebody needs to hear something. He knows what I don't know. I told them of a man of God that he wrote to say, God said you are to commission me to ministry. I never do with him before. I said, I don't do that. God said, don't lay hands suddenly on any man. I don't know you. He said, I will get uh, references from people you know who know me. So he did and I commissioned him. And I told him certain things which he repeated not too long ago. He said, you said so some 35 years ago. But then, things, I mean, things began to happen. My prophecies began to come to pass. And all of a sudden he found another father. Bigger, more prosperous, more flamboyant. And he decided to forsake this fellow who is old fashioned, doesn't know what's going on in the world now. He's still committed to fasting and praying. When now all we need to do is just speak the word. Suddenly things began to happen. Arm robbers attacked the new father. The new father had to jump out of the window to escape being killed. <laughs> a couple of, couple of weeks later, armed robbers attacked the new son. He had to jump out of the window <laughs> to escape them. And things began to happen. Suddenly, something told him, you need to go back to your father. Who you focus on? We determine who you will become. I give you one other example. In Second Kings chapter five, verse twenty to twenty-seven. Second Kings five, twenty to twenty-seven talks about a man called Gehazi. His focus was on Naaman. He saw Naaman. He saw who the wealth of a general I mean, that man was worthy, was successful. He focused on him, took his eyes off Elisha. Let me read the story. My master didn't take something from this man. Well, if he doesn't want it, I'll go and get it. He focused on the man and became a leper. He became Neyman Jr. Hmm. The only thing is that his own leprosy was never cleansed. And he created a lot of problems for children yet unborn. Who you focus on determines who you become. But then in this passage, he was talking about where you focus on. Let your focus be on things above. He's talking about looking up. Where you focus on will determine where you end. That's important. And we can take it from some very little examples. Take the story in Matthew 14, verse 23 to 32. Matthew 14, 23 to 32. You know the story? When Jesus was walking on water to go and meet the disciples who were in the storm, they saw him, they thought it was his spirit, they were afraid. He said, no, no, he said, be not afraid. Uh, Peter said, if it's you who asked me to come, he said, come. So he jumped out of the boat and began to walk on water. 
As long as he was looking up to Jesus, he was floating. But the moment he began to look at the waters and the storms, he began to sink. So if your focus is upward, you will go upward. If your focus is downwards, you will go downward. That's simple. Where you focus on, that's where you are likely to end. I'll take the story of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6. Read it from verse 1 to the end, Daniel 6, verse 1 to the end. Then it said, Don't pray. And in those days, if you see men pray, when they go on their knees, they lift up their eyes upward. They are always looking up. The eyes will be closed, of course, not like yours nowadays that you open to see what's going on. They close their eyes so they don't see any distractions. So even if you are in the den of a lion and your focus is still upward there, somehow they will pull you out. A force greater than those forces trying to keep you down will come and make sure you go upward. Praying people don't sink. Somehow, a force they cannot explain will pull them up. Or take the case of Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54 to 60. Acts 7, 54 to 60. Michael tells us about what happened after Stephen preached that powerful sermon and the people got angry and they began to stone him. He could have survived the stoning. But he looked up and saw something. You can't see the glory of God I want to stay here. That is the truth. And I should know what I'm talking about. If you see the glory of God in way, if you see him in all his beauty, you will beg him to take you away. I don't know if there's any of us old enough to remember the first congress we had in Elisha Grammar School in 1977. I was this young girl that came from the north. I had just finished preaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit came down and I mean, <laughs> we've never seen anything like that. People started praying. There was nothing we didn't do to try and stop the people. They just would not stop. I mean, the power of God was so mighty. The rest of the program for the day was forgotten. After the sermon, some five hours later, people were still praying. We rang the bell. We said, Amen. We, no, no, no. Nobody heard. So by the time people finally came down to Noma, there was this girl that came from the north. <laughs> she said, I must die today. I didn't even know what was happening. The, 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 we have people who call Bible study leaders, those who helped me then. They have tried everything to calm this girl down, they couldn't stop until around midnight. And I prayed that sermon around, uh, was it 3 or 4 p.m.? Around midnight they came to call me, we have a case there, this girl's there. And she was just going on, praying the tongues, singing beautiful hymns that you, you know these are not hymns you learned. She said, when I say, hey, 
Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the problem? Sir, I'm going. I've already seen the place. I have to ask God for wisdom. How do I deal with this? I invited everybody together. And there is this one who wants to die. God, what do I do? God gave me wisdom. So I say, hey, listen to me. I'm not asking you not to go. Just listen. You commit suicide, you will miss it. God showed you that place where you can go and labor. Not that you will get there alone, but that you bring many. So that as you labor for him, you come across difficulties, because there will be difficulties, there will be persecution. That which you have seen will keep you going. He said, oh, I said, that's it. When you see the glory of them, like Stephen saw, he saw Jesus standing by the right hand of God, saw the old. <laughs> you will not want to stay. All right, but then let's look at the other side. Let's look at somebody who saw something else, who focused on something else. A, a loser called Demas. In Philemon, the only chapter of Philemon, verse 24, Philemon, verse 24, Demas was described by Paul as my fellow laborer, associate apostle. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, the face of Demas shifted into the world. Second Timothy 14. And Paul says, sadly, Demas have forsaken me, having loved the present world. My prayer is that you have started well, you will finish well. And so, the Bible advises us in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. He said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Because he mentioned the things that are in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of eye, the pride of life, all these things that are shining, that would distract your attention. You say, they're not of the Father, and they will pass away. They will pass away. They will. If they don't leave you, you will leave them. Because <laughs> whether you like it or not, we came naked, we will go naked. Very frustrating, but so true. Mm. Very frustrating, but so true. Like I told them in uh, Abuja, was it? That uh, was on Monday. One of the greatest frustrations of the rich people is that they can't write the amount they have in their account on their forehead. So you are sitting by me. I said, I'm sitting by your side. <coughs> you can, uh, if you say you are richer than I, I ask you to prove it. They can't write it. And they don't like it. And when we talk about wealthy people, another source of frustration, you drove in in your Rolls Royce. I drove in in my Rolls Royce. Both of us have Rolls Royce. 
Let's say you have the biggest one, Phantom. About 250,000 pounds, basic. You have one, I have one. All that that says is that you have more than 250,000 pounds. So we still can't say, who is the richer of the two? You might have one pound, I might have ten. We all drove in. In the rice rice. And when wealth gets to a certain level, it becomes a body. It becomes a body. Unless, of course, you are channeling it in the right direction. We'll talk about that in the evening. It becomes a burden because in those days when you had only two pairs of shoes, one black, one brown, getting ready for church was easy. <laughs> Last Sunday I wore black shoes, so this Sunday I wore brown. Period. And you know, but you don't even care who is looking at you. It doesn't matter because well, whether you care or not, it's not going to alter situations. Now you have two rooms full of shoes. You know what to go through. Get ready for church. <laughs> You even have problem deciding what you are going to eat. Because there's so much. I've told this story before, but I don't want to tell more stories to this morning because they told me you are still going out. Although they said that I should take my time. <laughs> Do you know there are some of us who don't have money but have very healthy appetite? It's a blessing to be able to eat. It's a blessing to have just enough to eat. When it becomes too much, it becomes a problem. Some of us see eat food that have been cooked some six months ago uh, put in the freezer because there's so much thank God for abundance but uh, <laughs> what are you focusing on when it's time for you to go you can't take any of them along you do so uh, robbers will Break up on your grave. We've been praying for the salvation of the soul of a man since 1980 something. Finally, he came to see me last year. And we started talking. He said more than 30 years ago when you were talking to me about Christ, I wasn't listening because I was pursuing things. He said, but now I've seen it all. I have everything anybody can have. I've eaten anything anybody can eat. I've taken wine that I've been around since uh, 18 something. I have come to the conclusion, sir, all is vanity. So I wasn't the one preaching now. He <laughs> was the one preaching to me. Will you give your life to Jesus? He said, that's what I'm telling you. That's what I've come to do. That's what I've come to do. And then the passage that we read this morning said, because you are dead. Isn't that something? Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Galatians 2 verse 20 said, I am crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. 
You cannot be a true Christian if you are not dead. We are walking dead. Say, I have crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live. That passage said, You are dead and your life is hid in Christ. You have to die before you can, your life can be hid in Christ. Uh, one of the contributors uh, here said, Nobody can harm us. You need to understand that the full meaning of that is because I am dead. What makes suicide bombers so dangerous is that they are not afraid of death. When somebody is not afraid of death, he is a dangerous enemy. So he's dead already. So, <laughs> you want to fight? Come now. When a man is ready to die, he becomes a dangerous enemy. Dangerous to every enemy. If you are truly dead, dead to wealth, dead to all the attractions of the world, and then you become a danger to the devil because he has nothing again to use to tempt you. Enemies will flee from a man who is already dead because he is dangerous. And that's why he went on to say, you are dead, so keep the flesh dead. Mortify those, the part of your body that is still trying to raise up his ugly head. Tell that part, you are dead, you are dead. And I had to fast for a long time, for the first time. It wasn't planning to, I mean, because before... <laughs> I still remember the first time somebody asked me to fast for three days and three nights. I said, you want to commit murder? I never thought I could do it because before then the only time we fasted was Good Friday. And that is the 12th mid noon, 12th noon. And we'll be watching the clock from 9 a.m. So to go for three days and three nights without food, I thought that was murder. First time I had to fast for 30 days and 30 nights, the flesh told me you want to kill yourself. My answer is, I'm already dead. Dead people don't die. And if you are going to be a missionary, for example, <laughs> you better be dead before you leave home. I mean, my son in Libya was talking to me the other day. Son, with all this going on in Libya, I said, I said, I said, I am dead, so dead people don't die. I said, that's my boy. That's why we have 16 branches in Libya now. They can't drive him out. He said, I'm here. But the worst who can do is kill me, have you? And I'm already dead. <laughs> already dead. And in any case, if you have caught a glimpse of heaven, anybody who kills you is doing you a favor. Preventing you from committing suicide. Let me close. Before they say, Daddy, we know you came late, but that's, <laughs> that doesn't mean you should say everything one day. It says in that passage, when Christ who is your life shall appear, you shall be with him like in a glow. Whether you believe it or not, he is coming back. Oh, I know many of us don't even realize that anymore. Some people say, yeah, they've been talking about his coming, his coming, all oh, this year. He hasn't come yet. 
Every day brings his coming nearer. And you don't know when. First Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 54. First Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. Uh, he made it clear. He's coming. In the twinkle of an eye. At a time you are not even expecting. He will come. He will. And if he doesn't come by rapture, he will come when he takes you away by death. And the interesting thing is nobody knows when he's going to die. He only whispers it to those of us who are very close to him. Say, ah, get ready, you will soon be coming home. A friend of mine phoned his daughter. He said, please tell that the geo. I woke up this morning and God told me, son, you will soon be coming home. So I phoned him back and said, congratulations. Looks as if you are going to go before me. Because we've been friends since 1970-something. And I know his steadfastness. I said, I know, I'm sure you are ready. He said, oh, I'll be ready for years. I said, I know. I'm ready too. It's just that he decides when we will come. But it could come by rapture, it could come before tomorrow. One of my children asked me, why is it that every night when you are praying for us, you always say, and if you return before tomorrow, don't leave us behind. I said, because it could come before tomorrow. That's the truth of the matter. And if it comes before tomorrow, and the thing that will let you go, it's because of your commitment to one project that has nothing to do with it. I'll be sad. So how do you pray this morning? <laughs> there are so many prayer points one could bring out of here. Those of us who are already focused on him, our prayer will be, Father, don't let anything take my face away from you. And those who are not yet focused on him, say, Father, just take my eyes away from everything and let me focus on you. So go ahead, talk to the Lord for a few minutes.
not like your father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Father, once again we want to say thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for rearranging our focus. Those of us who have been focusing on things of the world, please, Lord, change our focus today. For those of us who are focused on you, my Father and my God, help us to remain focused. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. I will quickly teach you a little song. Uh, I will just teach you verse 1. If you remind me later, I will give you the other verses. It says, My Lord is coming again. Twice. Just as he has promised me, my Lord is coming again. I go right. My Lord is coming again twice. Just as he has promised me, my Lord is coming again. My Lord is coming again. My Lord is coming again. Just as he has promised me, my Lord is coming again. Four. as we take our offering and, I, and knowing that it's coming again
us to bless. Father, we thank you. Blessed be to your holy name. Daddy, please accept us and accept our offerings in Jesus' name. All the hands that has given to you this morning, bless them in return in Jesus' name. And give us a surprise. Thank you, Father. We pray.